Hey folks, I'm Alan Furstenberg. And I'm Leslie Pound. And we are Two Voice Devs. Two Voice Devs. Hey Leslie, thanks for coming on today. Sure, no problem. Thanks for um, inviting me. So, so for those of you that are wondering, Mark is still out dealing with some family issues. So I invited Leslie to join us today. Uh, Leslie is someone that I've, I guess we've been talking for about two years now at Voice Lunch and, and some other voice stuff. And both of us have kind of recently gotten into uh, generative AI stuff. And um, I thought it would be great to have you on to give your perspective on some of that JI stuff, uh, gen AI stuff, because it's a little different than mine. And, you know, we always like to see different perspectives. Um, yeah, we do get into some interesting conversations, um, frank conversations about this. Yes, and that's a lot of what I appreciate. Um, so why don't you tell us, uh, I guess, a little bit about yourself, about your background, how you got into this career? Sure. Um, well, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I wear a designer hat, an entrepreneurial hat, uh, a developer hat. And so it's hard to know which one to put on at which time. But my background is in college, um, I actually applied as a graphic arts major to San Luis Obispo and they lost my application. And then oh, they, dear. Yeah. <laughs> and then somewhere around April or, or something, I may, I said, Hey, what's going on? They go, Oh, we lost it. But the program you applied for is closed. So sorry. Um, looking at your scores, you can apply here, here, and here. And one of the places was English. So I said, okay, uh, English. And, um, then when I got into school, you know, doing English stuff, there was an elective we got to take. I think I could chase, take botany or basic program. Programming. And I took basic programming and was really pissed off the entire time because they were teaching it like I understood what they were talking about, which I did not. And uh, I don't think the class did either. And I was I was going to learn this stuff and I was going to teach it. And so from then I went on and I took assembler <laughs> and I took electrical engineering and symbolic logic in the same quarter. And I was like, oh, this all works together. And um, very cool. OK, yeah. I didn't actually get the, the degree um, because it was hard to do switch my major. So I just stayed with, with English and liberal, liberal arts and then took some classes afterwards. And the rest is history, as they say. Very cool. So, okay. So, so tell us a little bit about the rest. <laughs> oh, right. Um, yeah, I've just been on the forefront of things my entire career. And, and I don't know why, but I have in terms of in the web really early. I won't even tell you how early. Um, in charge of of intranets, in charge of information structures. Um, in fact, I have a tool back in the day where we had thumbs up and thumbs down to to user generated content. We used to call it back then. Um, so uh -huh. I think Zuckerberg stole that from me. <laughs> <laughs> it was about eleven years before he did it. I was also part of the first SaaS product um, for cam marketing campaigns. I was part of the first virtual assistant. Um, which well, turned in. You, you need to elaborate on that one a little bit more. So, so yeah, I was part of the first virtual, virtual assistant that was at SRI, um, International in the AI, the Artificial Intelligence Group. Um, and that turned into Siri and some other things, or at least there was a spin off of, to Siri and some other uh, endeavors. Um, but we were doing it all. We were doing voice, we were doing conversation. Uh, that was the first time I was introduced to conversational AI. I think that's when it first kind of became a thing um yeah so and then and when, a ton of stuff about afterwards. when was this so you said it spun off into about when were you doing this work uh mid 2000s okay yeah so i did that about for about six years um yeah and then i i went off of my own for a bit i did, did some things with smart contracts and smart contracts were a little different than the way they're interpreted now but I did some things with that. And then I, I invented a way for people to have user utterances be translated into database queries because most of the information is is in a database, at least business information. So, you know, give me invoices less than 200K um, for the third quarter, you know, mm -hmm. and then visualize it. Um, and then I did some things with education and I'm doing some consulting around that where you can write interactive stories for kids that are both visual and animated. Um, so it's it's a lot of stuff. And I also did a lot, I've done a lot of helping startups get off, figure out what their product's going to be. So I have designs for just about anything you can 
talk about uh, tagging on trucks to to see the the vibration so that when it gets to the eventual place it um hasn't been bounced around or the temperature hasn't dropped and then it's about to go bad um yeah you name it i've done it <laughs> so very very cool stuff you know you've got such a a, a breadth of information or of of, uh, of experience how do you feel like that helps you as a designer a developer an entrepreneur, a con, you know, a, a consultant, I guess. You know, I know this is two, two, two devs. And um, even though I do development, I don't consider myself a hardcore developer. There are people who are brilliant at it. And I'm sure you're one of those people. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not, so you know, some days I don't think so, but okay, thank you. <laughs> but I, you know, I love the engineers. I just think they, they work late. They make get the product out the door. And so I'm just, I'd love that group of people. They make it happen. I'm the one who makes it maybe useful and makes people want to buy it or makes people, you know, puts it into the real world, both from research and from engineering. So they're both two groups that don't necessarily understand the real world and how people make decisions and how people interact with with um, the product or the information set. I, I define a product this way. A product is anything the user is willing to spend on, but that means they might be spending their attention on it. It's not necessarily money mm. some of these days. So they're spending something on it. And that what make, that's what makes it a product. So that's all pretty cool. Um, I guess, you know, I, uh, coming from that, so, so based on that, what are the sort of things that you would uh, suggest people who are either just getting into it or have been into it a little bit and are looking for the next step what kind of advice would you give now? What what's what is important to study or to learn or to experience or to know now in in this environment? I guess I'm pretty sure you'd say the same thing. So you let me know if you you wouldn't. But one of the most important things that I, they don't necessarily get in their schooling is how to communicate what you're doing um, mm. and when you're in the head. When you're in school, it's all about trying to present the best front. When you're in a business. That's not what it's about. It's about getting the product out the door. And I'd rather have somebody, I'd rather have a, a, a media, mediocre programmer who can communicate and tell me when they're not on schedule or tell me when, when something's going on than one who's a rock star who doesn't communicate because they might produce something great, but it might be too late. And then it's going to impact the entire team in some way or the other. So communication is a big deal. That That's a great answer. It's, I won't disagree with it. It's not okay. the one that I would have picked, but I don't disagree with it. I, I think if I was answering my own question, I might mm -hmm. have said something like, it's the ability to continuously learn and adapt. You know, so we all learn a set of schools in, in boot camp, in school, in, you know, wherever we learn that initial set of, of developer skills. But those skills, the the some of the details of those skills are going to become obsolete over time, but the fundamentals of them don't. You know, the fundamentals of, well, how did I learn how to program in the first place? How did I learn this programming language in the first place? When I learn a new programming language, what are, what are the things that I already know about programming? And what are the new things that this language gives me? When I need to access a new library, what are the things that I'm already understand and what are the new concepts that i need to learn you know it's i that that would have been my answer but i like your answer <laughs> <laughs> well i really like stupid questions too because the problem is, is whenever you have a stupid question and you've got more than i don't know five people in a room somebody else has it too yeah and you're the brave one if you say it it's just like if you're not getting it there's probably somebody else who's not getting it um you know and it can be hard to to admit that you know no, that's but, a fantastic point. So I guess, calling, uh, yeah. you know, following up from that, that's a, a nice broad skill. What are the specific tools that I guess you're playing with or that you think other people should be um, playing with these days or? Well, I, I'm a bit stubborn. <laughs> so it takes me a long, yeah, I don't know if you knew that about me. Um, it takes me a long time to adapt to a new tool or a new, everybody says, this is great, this is great. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but then when I do something, I'm like, oh, holy crap, I should have done this a long time ago. Um, not always, but a lot of times that's my response. And having a good IDE, it hmm. changes everything. Um, now, I, I'm not saying the one I use is the best. I, I don't know because I haven't used a lot of others, but, but I use uh, JetBrains 
Um, they've got PyTorch and WebStorm. And they've, they've got them all, actually. And they, they allow you to, con to connect with the GitHub or your version control system. They do, they do deployment. They do, oh, it's just, it's just incredible what they do. You can put the cert, you can put your test framework in there and it'll tell you how this connects to that. And I, I just love it. No, I totally agree. I've been a JetBrains fan for a number of years now. I use their, uh, their IntelliJ Ultimate uh, package, which is kind of most of their package, you know, most of their other uh, IDEs bundled into one with the same plugins. Mm -hmm. Um when you're doing Android development, you're doing Android Studio, which is from IntelliJ. So I I really concur with you on that one. Uh, their interface is a little cumbersome, <laughs> <laughs> but once you learn it, you're, you're, you can do a lot of great things. So, Well, I think that's actually an important bit is that, you know, a lot of interface, I've, I've never seen an interface that delivers <laughs> enough power that isn't cumbersome on some level. You know, there is a learning curve. I could make it better, IntelliJ. If you want to hire, <laughs> you could do that. I'm not going to argue with you there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So as I said, both of us have been exploring more and more with generative AI stuff. What are uh, what are the things you're learning with Gen AI? What are you know your lessons or what are you doing with Gen AI these days, even? I love Gen AI. I, I mean, we talked about my background, and when you look at my background, it's like, like, like duh, you know, <laughs> English, English, uh, user interface, programming. It just all comes together in this this beautiful mix of what is this? How do people get information? How do they want to get information? And I've been doing conversational design, you know, prior to this. How do they want to interact with the information? What does that mean? for what software is, I think it actually changes the definition. Because, so just with voice, with voice, you bypass the developer and the designer's view and you can go straight to the information set if you know what it is. You can just ask for it, give me this, mm. give me this. So you've bypassed a huge part of what we do in terms of um, helping you. You're saying, you know, if, if, and this is the key question, you understand the use case for that system, and, and I don't know if you, you've probably heard me say this, if you have a shared understanding of what the application is supposed to do, then you can bypass all that and get to exactly what you want. Without that shared understanding, it's actually very difficult to figure out what a system does. You just walk up to a kiosk in the mall and there's just a voice interface. If you're at the mall, there's some context. But if it's just on your phone, there's less context. Well, but isn't that part a big part of it? I mean, we talked to, you know, we've talked any number of times uh, on this show, in Voice Lunch, everywhere else about exactly how important context is. And, and isn't it that context that kind of gives us at least a big chunk of that shared understanding? Oh, absolutely. I mean, well, it doesn't, it doesn't human conversations, right? I know who I'm talking to. If I hear the same words coming out of the mouth of the mouth, the mouth of a three-year-old versus a fireman, right? You know, uh, it's really hot in here. There may be a fire. It's a totally different conversation between the two. The words are exactly the same. And in a computer, that's what we're getting. We're getting the words, not the context. Now, who said it? How they said it? When they said it? are extreme are things that we as humans take for granted in human conversation and now that we're dealing with these generative systems that are even more human the question is and on top of that they're getting information from different bits and pieces of a larger information set it fuzzy i mean you talked about that uh, that how do do we as humans interpret that information how do we as developers guide to the extent that we do now, guide the users in interpreting that information. So how do you feel generative AI is, is helping do that or can help do that or should help do that? Well, I mean, obviously the big thing is, holy crap, people are going to, one is it's, you talk to it and it sounds, it understands you. It comes back with something reasonably intelligent in your language, at least in my language. It, it remembers what you said, at least within a session. It, that's it's astounding in that sense it sounds human um so first the holy crap moment and then the 
oh my gosh, this is using my, my words moment. Mm. So you can ask about photosynthesis and say, well, how do plants eat? You know, and it'll come back, plants eat by blah, blah, blah. And it'll use your words. And I think that's extremely powerful. So there's a lot of elements to it that are that are fun. Oh, good. that's what I was going to say. The real insight here for me, or at least one of them was users, humans, like it. They like having these conversations. When the system actually understands them, they love talking to this thing and going back and forth. And we didn't know that before in conversational design. Our systems were so limited that we didn't quite know if people were just going to want to go, give me the answer and get out of here because you're just a machine. No, that's a good point. You know, I mean, even a year ago, everyone was saying, you know, conversation design, yeah, it's okay, but mostly users are want to have one shot experiences. They don't want to have a conversation. And, you know, we're discovering no users are okay with having a conversation when it makes sense. Um yeah, when yeah, when it's intelligent, when it's um it's back and forth, right? Uh you know, a conversation is a dance. A conversation is is inhuman. Let's let's, let's uh -huh. go back to the you say something, I say something. We we kind of meander around, right? You push a little bit in this direction, you feel me resisting, and you go someplace else. I, I think one of the things I learned in in conversations before Gen Gen AI is human conversations are primarily social. There are few, even in businesses, the social aspect takes precedent over the transactional part of it mm. even, even on, a, on a customer service call if the other person's crying even if it's the, the person you're supposed to giving you help you're going to stop everything and you're going to address it probably there's just the social dynamics take precedence over other things and that'll be interesting to see if your customer service agent is a gen ai that's kind of taken away it might you might have that impression but yeah, I, I was going to say, as developers, how do we, how do we, and do we want to try to develop systems that that mimic that? I mean, how closely do we want to mimic that, and how are you worried that, um, yeah, that pe how people will react when they realize yeah. they've got a robot on the other end? Does that change the dynamic? Yeah, I think there's two things to say with that. One is it's delightful to have a system that's that can do repartee with you and that is surprising surprising is a great feature in in most contexts in some contexts it can be annoying as hell but yeah there's that but there's also i think there has to be disclosure mm. i think there needs to be a sound or a thing to let you know you are not talking to a human i haven't totally examined all the different use cases but that seems to be pretty important um Otherwise, there's a deception going on and uh, you're going to be reasoning with it like you think it's a human and it's not. Uh, uh, it's just not. Right. Okay. So, and the way it works right now, it might make up the answers. Oh, how's the weather in in Iowa these days? And, yeah, that's. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's been hot all week, you know, and you're you're there having this rip, you know, this intimate moment about the weather and it's not really. No, that's a good point, and I and I think that's dangerous, and certainly it's something that as developers we need to to constantly remember is that it can just make stuff up. And we need to try to build systems to minimize how much they hallucinate and make up. You know, we need to be careful about how we're uh, writing our prompts and how we're we're crafting the baseline prompts before the user says anything else. Um, and give it the contextual information to reduce that hallucination, at least at least in these kinds of stuff. You know, you've also talked about how for creative stuff, you don't necessarily want to put those same limits and guardrails on. You almost want to encourage hallucinating a little bit, if I could put it that way. Yeah, it's funny. Hallucinate is such a human word, right? And that's <laughs> not really, it's not a human thing going on here. Well, um, well, but so are phrases like understand and, you know, and we, we toss all of these around as well. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I, it, yeah. What was the question? I forgot the question. <laughs> um, 
it was it was I guess getting to the points where you know you've talked about creative uses of these systems, oh. and there we want to relax our restrictions on uh, how much it makes stuff up, or we oh, may well, want absolutely. to. Alan, it's making everything up. It's making everything up, right? It doesn't know any okay. of it is yeah. accurate. We know. We can say, oh, that's accurate. Or or, or the problem is when, is when we don't know. When the user is going, I, you know, there's a statement here. George Washington, you know, was the first president of the United States born in Wyoming. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and we know which part of that that's wrong most of us but if for for maybe a um, first grader maybe they don't right and so it's making it all up there's no there's no waiting on it that this part's almost true and this it doesn't know that so the question is how do we mitigate for it and when do we mitigate for it and we don't we mitigate less probably in the instance where it's it's for entertainment it's for games it's for inspiration and i do think inspiration is a big use case hmm um, we all need a kick in the pants and all fields have some type of creative aspect to them, even office work or programming. <laughs> so just to see how somebody else does it and just to watch and, and, and bounce off ideas, I think can be tremendously powerful. Okay. Um, I don't know. Do you want to elaborate more on that inspiration, using it, using it for inspiration? Cause I think that's, that's certainly a powerful element and it's not one that I, I certainly think about all too much, you know, the, in the last uh, the last episode I I did uh, with Noble, I was very much focusing on you know using Gen AI to kind of translate between machine you know digital machines and fuzzy humans you know, um, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you know when when you talk about inspiration you're talking about using it more as a I don't know almost you know uh, not so much translating between the two but more like coming up with something that lives in our space to begin with and letting us take it from there yeah absolutely well i can give you i'll give you a bunch of examples but i the one I've, I've, i know i've talked about before was when i put my resume in there and i put a couple job ads and i said recreate my key accomplishments based on these job ads and then for some reason i had i had a plug-in on it that did voice out and i didn't even realize it and then it came back and it started speaking out loud wow you know? Leslie is a seasoned professional who blah, 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 blah. And I was like, dang, I want to hire her. You know, it sounded so good. I was ready to go out and tackle the world. It was like, oh, so that was inspiration. But it was very personal inspiration because it was about me. But, you know, it can be about a story you're writing. It can be whatever field you're in. You can put prompts in there that'll give you new ideas. I'm in the real estate market in Milwaukee. You put in a couple um uh, house descriptions and then you put in the bare bones description of the house you want and say rewrite this description based on these characteristics and it may give you back crap but it may give you back something really interesting and what i've noticed with prompting is you you free phrase it you can get a whole it'll it'll give you a whole different spin on it um i've gotten it to come back and go no i don't know what you're talking about i refuse to answer hmm you know, it feels like that from my end, but you just rephrase it and it's like, oh, girl, you know, and it just goes on and on. Yeah. That's one of the things that I find is really interesting is that prompts can make a big difference. And even sometimes prompts that work really well on one system or one version of a system don't work as well for another. So you really need to, to kind of re-engineer your prompts depending on your platform. Um, and that's kind of, backwards from how we as developers think about things yeah you know we think about it as you know the program is the program you know here's the syntax this syntax is going to hold true the next version and the version after that and the version after that and you know, you port it to a new programming language and yeah the syntax may change a little but it's the same syntax um and with with designing yeah. prompts it's totally yeah, it's, different yeah so the big question is going to be how much do we adapt as developers to this new way of conversing with with the system? And how much do we force the system to adapt to the way we've always done things? I think in the short run, we probably do that because there's a whole ton of developers out there just itching to make it what they're used to. Um, but in the long run, I'm not so sure. I'm really curious about the use cases for one versus the other. When is it really valuable? 
so so now that we know that users will do this dance with the computer, do this dance with this is LLM. When is that best suiting the user and in what use cases? And then when do we need to come in and kind of steer it, right? When do we come in? When do you need a docent and when don't you need a docent? Ooh, that's a really um, good, that's a great analogy. I like that analogy a lot. Um, so, so let me ask you, what do you think the change will be? What will it be like for developers down the road? I won't ask even for a time frame because I've given up on time frames in this industry. <laughs> you know, I'm, that pausing, I'm pausing a lot here because I can see different scenarios. And one of those scenarios might be rather scary. It, I don't think it has to be, but it might be, is that there's a changing of the guard. Um, if the skill set, this fuzzy skill set you talk about is different than what most developers think in or what they've been trained mm. to think in. And if that's the case, that this fuzzy way of understanding information and translating fuzzy into channels is um, is valuable, then we either have to retrain as engineers or we have to get it, there needs to be a different group of people coming in the door. Well, um, think, about, think about the difference between the people who originally, who do ones and zeros in the bios and the people who are writing, you know, I don't know, JavaScript to create a page that, you know, changes colors when you mouse over it. I, I'm laughing only because that's exactly what I was going to say is that, <laughs> you know, when modern programmers think about it, we think about going into an IDE and typing out code. Um, and that notion is only a couple of decades old. You know, that's, that's yeah. relatively new. You know, before then it was, we were putting things onto punch cards and we were putting them onto punch cards in very specific formats that Absolutely. we would find incredibly constraining today. And before the punch cards, that was, you know, you were manipulating the, the ones and zeros directly. You know, you were flipping switches on the front and loading them in one set at a time and at each stage the skills required changed they mm -hmm. moved from highly mathematical incredibly technical to having a different set to being to needing to think about the bigger pictures of things and how we put those together all the class of software that just makes the computer work right it just makes it work makes the phone work makes the internet work that nobody ever sees but it's there and needs to be written and rewritten and, and things like that. There's all that. So that's probably going to persist um, in some way. But maybe the application software where it's a an, an actual user who needs to use it, it seems like it's going to change. I mean, just, just take the categories of front end, back end, and middleware. Mm. This kind of blows the lid off that to a certain extent. If it's the end user who's actually going directly to the back end in some fashion what happens to middleware or at least it morphs it changes it, it in the short run in the long run it might dramatically change um, maybe maybe in the long run it's more like a um a pull model instead of a, a excuse me a push model where the system is knows you enough that it can actually make real world interruptions at a certain level i i maybe no, that's an interesting that point. And, and certainly we're seeing that more and more, but we also still see people having, you know, what would then be more like one-off interactions, you know. Um, today, I happen to want to know about something else that I never have asked about before. So my profile that my, my smart agent has won't have the answer on hand and can't just push it to me. I've got to ask about it in some way. Well, you know, I, I recently wrote an article on philosophy being the killer AI, uh, the killer app for AI. And it's really hard not to get into philosophy when you're talking about this, because it all comes down to our values. What are we valuing? Are we mm. valuing the interaction? What are we choosing to value? Are we in, are we valuing novel, novelty? Do we really want to know? We only have so much time. Humans only have so much time. 
And how do we decide what to interact with and what what to spend our capital on? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if product is, the definition of product is spending your attention on it or your money, how do we make that decision? Now, maybe as a developer, that's not something that you think about, but it will definitely impact what you do. Well, there are, I, I feel like that could take us down so many other tangents. Um, and and maybe we'll oh, have tangents. to- <laughs> Tangents are wonderful. I love it. But, you know, there's only so much, speaking of time, there's only so much time that we can pack into an episode each week before our viewers start losing interest. Um, I guess be, before we sign off, is there anything that you kind of want people to know or to think about with with Gen AI these days? What's I guess the the one or two big things that you really are are looking uh, hoping that people will will play with and work on right now? Yeah, I I did mention I think this to to you before is we got to start thinking about mining the prompts themselves. And the discussion that, that's ongoing, and I talked about how we can use this in a classroom and how the social aspect of this is can be quite significant. If everybody's kind of gleaning uh, information in a, in a chain, what is significant about that? What do we learn about how people interact with it? And, and social, once we add social to this, I think it could blow mm. the lid off, off of it. I mean, that, that's already, not already blown the lid off of it. But we start to have other people engage. Right now, it's a solo endeavor, pretty much. Um, and we're thinking of it in that terms. But I think once we add social, it'll... I think that would be really interesting. You know, one of... From from one thing that, that we've talked about the last time uh, you and I had talked about this sort of thing, um, I was picturing, you know, you would be engaging in a, in, um, a, a conversation, you know, in, in an educational environment, uh, a conversation maybe with some some semi-structured prompting built in. And as your your questions could be kind of, um, what's the way I, I would think about it? But what's the way I would think about it without it sounding too creepy? Um, your, your interaction, your part of the interaction would be recorded and kind of uh, using uh, vectors using uh, this notion of embeddings right. grouped with other people who were mm. saying similar things. And, and because of AI, we know what is similar and what isn't, or yeah. we have a better what, grasp of what, it, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> what if you're going through and tagging it about, oh, now I get it. This phrase gave it to me. And, and 12 other people say that same thing for a university course. That could be a rich conversation in person with humans and the instructor about what's going on. Why did that lead you to this thought, lead you to this thought, lead you to this thought, which is what learning is. You know, learning is looking at information and gleaning more information from it and putting it together with other information. But I, I did want to say one thing. I think my advice right now is don't panic. <laughs> Excellent advice. You know, and, and on that, I think that's the right note to, to go out on. Um, so we would love to hear uh, what folks think uh, about uh, all of these ideas and especially about not panicking. Um, where's the, a great way for, for folks to get in touch with you? Sure. I, um, I'll give you my email and you can put it up on the screen, but also Leslie, L-E-S-L-I-E-D, as in Diane Pound, P-O-U-N-D at gmail.com. Okay. That's Diane Pound, gmail.com. Okay. And uh, you're also available on LinkedIn? Yes. Contact me on LinkedIn. So love to hear folks uh, reach out to Leslie directly or comment uh, below. And we look forward to, uh, I hope you have, you have you back another time on Two Voice Devs. On Two Voice Devs. Take care, Leslie. Have a great week. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Bye. <laughs>